that you will attract some people to get stirred in their hearts more than they are now. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. When the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking to the leaders of Israel and to the common people, to the Pharisees, the scribes, and the priests, he showed them by his words, I am the God of Israel. By his words, he was declaring to them, Here is the Lord your God that you have been worshipping for centuries. Here I am. And that's why they crucified him. Do we get the significance of that? Because I don't think we do. We know that he, he is God. But if you went to Sunday school, as I did, you had little pictures, here's Jesus. You see pictures of Jesus all over the place. You, 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 you hear about the parables. You visualize Jesus walking in Palestine. And if you visit Israel, you see all the scenes. Your minds, our minds are taken up with this man, this son of man, who walked those dusty streets. And indeed, that he was the son of man. Indeed, he is man today. But we concentrate and focus on that aspect of him, his being and overlook in that form, in that man, as that man who walked the dusty streets was the Lord God of Israel. The Lord God of Israel descended from heaven to earth and was made manifest or visible in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a mystery. You can never explain it. You could never form a creed about it unless you use scriptures and say, well, the scripture says this and the scripture says that. So today we're looking into some scenes uh, where Jesus was. And we open our Bibles to Mark chapter 11, first of all. And that chapter opens with a colt being bought, brought to Jesus, that he would ride to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem, from the Mount of Olives. And so he must have gone down and up. I don't know the geography. And we well know the story, how as he went on the cold, they threw their clothes in front of him, they got down the the palm branches and they threw them on the road and they called out in verse 9 they shouted it says they were shouting you only shout to a hero you only shout to a king they were shouting to the king Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord he was coming in the name of their Jehovah they recognized him as the Messiah. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. That's what they shouted. Now for them and for the disciples and for the mother of uh, Zebedee, for the mother of uh, James and John, the children of Zebedee, they were looking for the Messiah to sit on the literal throne of David in Jerusalem. That's one and another reason they crucified him. The church is doing that today. How carnal we are. They were carnal. They did not understand. They thought he was going to literally have some kind of a throne probably in Herod's palace. I don't know if their thoughts went that far, but that's Herod was king, had been king. And of course he died when the baby Jesus was uh, just a baby, maybe two. Uh, I'm not sure how old he was. But his heirs ruled not as king, but they were there occupying the palaces. There were two in Jerusalem. Now I wonder if those people visualize this Messiah as living in the palaces. Of course they would. David lived in the palace. They visualized the Messiah 
operating in the temple because he was to come as a king and a priest in the knowledge that had been imparted to them. And yet he ended up being crucified. They were very wrong because Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. So they had a worldly aspirations and the church has worldly aspirations. This is one reason that leaders in the church who should have known better about a generation ago, and my generation and the generation down, should have known better than to absorb the teaching of prosperity. Why did they do it? Because their minds had already, all their lives, been connected with the thought of a, a Messiah who's going to return to the literal Jerusalem and sit on the throne there and reign for a thousand years. And they envisaged they were coming back. And I don't know where they thought they were going to live. I don't know where, where they thought they were going to, uh, uh, where they were going to get their houses from. They've been in heaven for seven years. They couldn't go back to their own. It was probably destroyed if the, in the tumults. They didn't give a thought to the fact that after the resurrection, and, and none of us have, after the resurrection, when the disciples went fishing in, in the end of John's gospel, Peter said, I'm going fishing, and the others went with him. And the Lord came in his resurrection body. And they caught a superabundance of fish. Jesus is not stingy, stingy or meager in his supply. We can expect him to supply for us if it's his will. Because it's certainly not the will of God that all the millions of India who know Jesus Christ and living in poverty, it is not the will of God that they should ever be wealthy or rich. Let's face facts. And what happened? They took a big fish at his command and cooked it and he gave them food to eat. He did not eat, according to Mark's gospel. He did not eat. He gave it to them. Why did he not eat? Because he had his resurrection body. His resurrection body was not flesh and blood, but flesh and bones, the kind of body we're going to get. So if the church is in heaven for seven years, as is taught, or three and a half, as is taught, then descends to earth in their resurrection bodies, they won't even be eating. So, so they won't be living like ordinary folks. Nobody's ever thought that one out. Amazing, isn't it? All of us, we miss so much when we read the Bible. And so they were hailing King Jesus. Then uh, the, the time, time proceeds, maybe two days later, uh, Jesus and his disciples came to Jerusalem. He entered the temple in verse 15. And what was there? In the temple itself were tables of money changers and, and men sitting there selling pigeons. The pigeons were for offerings. Now, this is a significant point that I have missed and I've never heard anybody speak, speak about. They were selling pigeons. Who, who, who used the pigeons? The poor. When Mary and Joseph went to offer Jesus at the temple, I think it was the, his eighth day, to be circumcised, it would appear, whether he was or not, the scriptures haven't indicated. They brought pigeons. Mary and Joseph were poor. They did not have the gold that the wise men had brought and given to baby Jesus as has been taught around charismatic circles. They were poor. They offered pigeons if you, if you uh, look up the record somewhere else. Whoever offer, offered pigeons uh, were, were only poor people. Because what about the lambs and the goats and everything else? So they were oppressing the poor as well as contaminating the temple. 
And, and, and Jesus came. And, and it's, uh, it's recorded in other Gospels, Matthew probably and elsewhere. Uh, he overturned the tables and he got a whip and drove them out. He got a whip. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He's not just gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He's judge. He was showing here that he was judge. All judgment had been given into the hands of the Son. Now he begins his act of judgment, even before he went to the cross and was resurrected. At his resurrection, according to Daniel 7, I think it was, yet yeah, Daniel 7, the Ancient of Days is sitting on the throne, and of course that's God, and there, somebody like the Son of Man, Daniel sees, approaches and sits on the right hand. He's the judge. Jesus Christ is pictures. So after his resurrection, he entered into a, a he entered into his judgmental reign. He's judge. And that's never taught. Now is it? I've never heard it. But that's the fact. Here he's already acting, beginning to act like it. And that shows his deity. Uh, somewhere else they said, in verse 28, that afterwards, when he was walking in the temple, afterwards, another day, he was walking in the temple. And the, in verse 27, and the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, why, why, what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? After all, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't an elder. He wasn't a, a scribe in the Jewish economy. And of course, he would not tell them. You can read the verses. But going back to verse 15 and 16 and 17, where he overturned the tables of the money changers. It, it, you know, somebody said to me once, at the church, Pentecostal church I was in, Glad Tidings Tabernacle, they started selling books at the back, just a few. And I, uh, uh, there was one girl said to me, she said, you know, that's wrong. And of course I brushed it off because I didn't think it was. But it makes you wonder, doesn't it? All this money making that goes on in our churches, it makes you wonder. Because let's face it, the booking industry and the music industry is a money making machine like no other. I mean, I've been, I've been to uh, uh, Nashville. I've been to Nashville. I've been to the Christian, uh, Christian uh, music places, you know, each Esky one has Park. an office. Huh? Esky Park. No, no. Uh, every, each one has their office and I've been to the different ones. We went into Amy Grant's manager's office and, <laughs> and on the table was her record in those days and, and, and we could see the sublimal sexy uh, advertising and the American guy we were with, you know, Lorene and I, and he, we looked at it. Ah, look at this. And we pointed it out to his manager, her manager. Uh, I think it was her manager. Whoever it was was managing the place. And uh, uh, he was somewhat aghast, whether he knew it was there or not. But, you know, a blimey advertising is used on television and everywhere, on the records and the books, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and, and, and it hits the person's soul. And this is, she had was singing then. She hadn't made the crossover. And she was singing then Christian Muse only. And uh, we met the author. We, met, we met, went to her church. And uh, her, uh, she hadn't made the crossover. And we were at Estes Parks because Lorene sang there. She had been invited to sing there. And uh, we were, really, we were disgusted. We came back to Australia and we just said, you could never sing 
As a Christian, you could never really sing on this church scene, what we saw. And they were discussing then that Amy Grant and others would make the crossover from Christian music to secular music. And believe you me, it was money-making as could be. Because we were there listening to what they were saying. This was a, a, what do you call it, a kind of a seminar and you could go to different classes. It was quite an interesting machine, um, experience. We met the top musicians at that time and that's a different age and generation. So this is what has crept into the church. You know, I know it's not a Jewish temple today. We're not in a Jewish temple today, but we're in the house of God. Now here's a significant thing that Jesus said. He was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? And you have made it a den of robbers. Now he was speaking to the rulers of the Jews. But he was referring to Isaiah 56 Chapter 56, verse 7. And that chapter is a messianic chapter. Even though the prophet Isaiah couches his prophecy in language suitable for his era, his era was the temple. His era was burnt offerings and sacrifices. His era was a, an absolute adherence to the law, particularly the Sabbath. So that's where the people were at in those days. And he gave his prophecy in terms that they would understand according to their vision. Because, you know, not even the prophets really recognized the absoluteness of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, even if they had a glimpse. They didn't have the glimpse that we've had of Calvary or should have had. If we've heard the right preaching and if we read our Bibles continually, in Isaiah 56, he says in verse 6, and the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord. He's talking about the Gentiles to minister to him. The Gentiles are coming into the church to minister to God, to love the name of the Lord. Now, the name of the Lord in the New Testament is Jesus. It's not the Lord Jesus Christ as such. His name shall be called Jesus. He is Emmanuel, God with us. We love the name of Jesus, even though the world especially different portions of the church, use that name to name their ch children. Don't let's lose the significance of it. It's really the name of Jesus. We're to love him. And then he, he goes on and relates it to their living conditions then, which was keeping the Sabbath. But then he said, <coughs> excuse me, and holds fast my covenant. We're under the new covenant. We have to hang on to the new covenant, not the old covenant. The old covenant's been done away. And the church for the last uh, 1900 years, 1800 years anyway, has continually gone back to the old covenant. Oh, they did it in the book of Galatians. They did it in the book of Hebrews. They did it in other books. The church has been doing it all these centuries and the Pentecostals are doing it and the Charismatics are doing I'm a Pentecostal and I'm a Charismatic. That's why I mention them. Because we're supposed to have more truth than anybody else and yet we're going back to the old covenant. We should not be doing it. We have to hold fast to the new covenant. It doesn't say so here. But God's covenant now is the new covenant. It has been a, The old covenant has been abolished. Hebrews tells us that. I think it's the last verse of chapter 8, but one of those chapters, the last verse, it's done away with. It's finished. We have to hang on to the new covenant. And every believer who hears me saying this, yeah, do it. And every pastor, if you happen to be listening, teach it. 
were under the new covenant. Then he says, these I will bring to my holy mountain. Of course, Hebrews 12, uh, 20 to 24 tells us the holy mountain is the church of Jesus Christ. It's Zion, the heavenly Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. And we have been brought to that holy mountain. And it says he will make them joyful in my house of prayer. His house is to be a house of prayer. Ephesians 2 tells us we're in the household of God that has saved Jew and saved Gentile. Both of us together. One church, one nation, one people, one redeemed, one children of God. And we are in his household and it is a house of prayer. Now, that really struck me when I read it again this morning. His house that Jesus said is to be called a house of prayer. Not a house of spreading out the gospel. Hmm. No, it doesn't say that, does it? Yeah, I'm just sticking to the scriptures. There's no verse in the Bible that says the house of God will be called a house of spreading out the gospel. It says, well, it'll be a house of prayer. And it cannot be a house of prayer if you haven't got the word in your heart to some extent. Because your prayer's life is based on your knowledge of the word, whether it's a scant knowledge or a deep knowledge, whether it's a progressive knowledge, whether you've heard error, and we've all heard error. Even now, as I read the Bible, something will strike me and I'll say, ah, yeah, I remember a certain preacher 50 years ago saying such and such a thing, and I just believe what they said. It's not that at all. I just did that about three days ago. We're influenced by what we hear. Now, I heard a lot of good things. If I hadn't heard the good things, I wouldn't be here. So I'm not passing off what the men and women of God have done in days past gone by or are doing in days to, uh, today. Praise God for everything they have done. Praise God whether you got Christ in the Catholic Church, praise God you got him, which would be very few. Praise God if you found him in an Anglican church or a Presbyterian or a Methodist or a Salvation Army or an Episcopalian or a Pentecostal or a Charismatic or a uniting, uh, United Pentecostal who don't believe in the Trinity. Praise God if you found Christ and we do not despise any truth that you have. Thank God you're my brother, you're my sister. But we want to get our lives right. We want to progress in God. We want to mature. We want to be ministering to others what we found. We have to minister to others. And, and we're going to touch on that later when I get round to it. It happens to have come in uh, what I've written down. We have a responsibility to tell others. We have to minister it. But it hasn't been called a house of ministry. Now, we know the body of Christ is a, is a body of ministers. But it's not called the house, God's house. Yeah, we know it's the body of Christ. That's, the, that's in a different sense. And the body of Christ is, shows we are joined to Christ. But here... Jesus is relating to the people of God, to the temple of God. So before, we're the body of Christ, we're the temple of God. Because in Ephesians 2, it shows that those who are in the household of God, they are those who have done what is set out in the first portion of the chapter, where it says, uh, by grace are you saved through faith where it says he has lifted us up with Christ, where it says we are resurrected with Christ, that's salvation. Now then in, in, in chapter 2, verse 18, I think it is, it says we approach God, approach the throne in the spirit. Now he's not talking about for salvation. We've already got it. He's talking about prayer, 
that the Bible sets out should be as being in the Holy Ghost. Now, that's a serious thing because most of us have spent most, most of, of, the li of their life not doing that. I can't, I can't include myself there because I've done so mu much of it. I do pray in the Holy Ghost. I've been doing it for how many years? Half a century. I have prayed, not as much as I should have, but I have prayed thousands of hours probably in the Holy Ghost. So I cannot class myself with the others even though I, ha I am in their shoes and have been in their shoes. But most people do not do that. Most Christians hardly ever speak another word in other tongues. Most, most Christians don't believe in it. But it says in Ephesians 2, and I'm sure it's verse 18, we approach God in the Spirit. If you're in the Spirit, according to Pete, uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, and even other verses, we're praying in other tongues. That's in the Spirit. We're approaching God in the Spirit. Now, there are times when we approach God in the name of Jesus, through the blood of Christ. We offer our petitions. We offer praise. We use our own language. Uh, we, we say a sermon. <laughs> Have you heard how, have you listened to most prayers in, in churches, their little sermons? See, everybody, you know, is conscious that everybody else is there. And so we pray to God and also include uh, uh, droplets for the people listening. <laughs> you can't do that if you're praying in tongues. But of course, no one person would get up in a church meeting and, and pray in tongues unless it was interpreted. But all the people together should be getting up and praying in other tongues, particularly in prayer meetings, and particularly in worship, and particularly in prayer in every meeting. We should have it in every meeting. Look, I've been in evangelistic meetings, not in India, because we generally have the evangelistic meetings, we always do, except once. We had it in the hall. Oh, uh, uh, but you have it outside. I don't know if they do it today. And so you've got all these mixed people, except in Pakistan, I think we had, yeah, in Pakistan we, we had worship. But uh, in Australia, not in our meetings, but in other, in charismatics meetings, always every Sunday night, which was a gospel service specifically, there was worship. We sang, the, the choruses that were a lot better than are around today. And uh, then we went into a time of worship and lots of people were worshipping in other tongues. It was allowed, not frowned on, and uh, the pastor was probably happy, happy it was happening. Uh, he didn't actually originate it, if my memory serves me right. So what I'm saying is, yeah, this is what we should be doing in every church, in every meeting, worshipping and praying in other tongues when we're having a meeting. Because God's house is to be called a house of prayer for all nations, all the Gentiles who come in. Because the Church of Jesus Christ, you know, brings in the Gentiles. It says in Romans 11 that, that uh, everything will go on as far as giving out the gospel is concerned, until the completion, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. There's a certain number, obviously, that God has in mind uh, by that fullness. And, and uh, uh, so the, the majority of believers always were, always will, except uh, after, before, uh, at, at the end of the book of Acts, from then on, the majority of believers by far are Gentiles. Probably 99 to 1 over the centuries. That's how God, much God loves the, the whole world of people. Now, so the chief priests and, priests and the scribes were angry and they wanted to kill him. 
But all the people were absolutely astonished. Fancy being astonished at that. They would have been astonished at a lot of other things. But they were astonished. That included it. The, he, he, theirs was supposed to be the Jews who were the followers of God, and they were. And they were astonished because he said, they, he quoted Isaiah and said, my house shall be called a, a house of prayer. Amazing. I wonder if there was a teaching that it had some relativity to Gentiles. I'm not sure. But it amazes me that they, that they marveled that he said this. So then when we come to verse 27 and verse 28, which we've already touched on, they said to him, whose authority? Now, as we go through these chapters, which I would like to do just briefly, uh, he mentions the, sto the stone that, <coughs> excuse me, the builders rejected in verse 10. He talks about the Sadducees in verse 16 of chapter 12. And he says, now the Sadducees came to him. And uh, see, they didn't believe in the resurrection. He did not. He did not rebuke them the way he rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees and the elders. But he did rebuke them. Because he was proving that the, the course is a resurrection. He said, you are wrong. Verse 24. Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. How many believers or people in our charismatic and Pentecostal and Baptist and other churches really do not know the scriptures? It's not enough to know them intellectually and know all about the teachings of, say, Amos and go through the, the books like that as some churches do. It's not enough just to hear bits of sermons. It's not enough just to read it haphazardly. It's not enough to read the scriptures incorrectly, which is what we all have done on occasions and which is widespread. You have to say that much of the teaching comes from a wrong understanding of the scriptures and Jesus rebuked them and said, is not this the reason that you are wrong? Is not this the reason that I have been wrong over the years in different aspects? Is not this the reason that many of, most of you are wrong in some areas? All wrong about the millennium. I can tell you that if you believe it. It's because you do not understand the scriptures, Jesus said. You don't know the scriptures. You read them. They're in your mind. You've got this doctrine and that doctrine. Even the Pharisees had wrong doctrines. Jesus said, you go over land and sea to make a convert and you make him like yourself, and you both fall into the ditch. Now, Jesus taught these things to them, and every church believes that the four Gospels are for us today, because most churches base a lot of their teaching from the Gospels and not the Epistles, and include the Old Testament. You listen to the sermons, that's where they're based on. Very rarely do you get an expository... In fact, I don't know that I've ever heard an expository sermon on any part of the epistles. Now, some of the old preachers in the old days, I forget the names of some of them. Maybe it was F.B. Meyer, but a lot of those early preachers, they gave expository preaching. I think Spurgeon did. Many did, but not today. You do err. Uh, because you know the scriptures. Now those are solemn words. 
We should take them to heart. We need to know the scriptures. And particularly, as it says in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. We're supposed to know all the scriptures in relation to the gospel. Now, I doubt if we would be expected to know all the history that went on about around Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. But you want to know something? The leaders have better know. Because if the leaders don't have some in, in, inkling, they're teaching everybody wrongly. That's why they teach about the, the millennium and the uh, seven years in heaven and all the rest of it. They err because they do not know the book of Daniel. They do not know the book of Isaiah. They do not know the book of Galatians. I mean, let's face it. Do not know. Now, I have to confess I've been in that position because uh, I don't want everybody to think I think that I've known everything all my life and I'm coming from that angle. I'm not. I have been followed all the beliefs of the Assemblies of God and the Pentecostals. Not all the beliefs of the Charismatics. Certainly not the beliefs of the Laterite. Certainly uh, not the beliefs of the, of the laughing move of the Toronto Blessing. No, I rejected those. So all of us, let's take heed. We must know the scriptures, particularly the word of Christ, which is the New Testament. And as we said the other day, handling aright, dividing correctly the word of truth. What, what was it? Where was it, Hillary? 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. One of the first verses I memorized when I bought my first Bible at age 15. Study Bible. And I think I forget where it's found. Okay, so then he said, you're not only err because you know not the scriptures, but you don't know the power of God. Now, all believers believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know the power of God to that extent. We all believe that the Lord is coming and we all believe that we're going to put on immortality. You hear that at every funeral service that any part of the church conducts whether they believe in salvation of personal salvation or not everybody believes that we do believe that but we don't we err because most Christians don't know the power of God in the Holy Ghost if we are not praying in the Holy Ghost fairly regularly Fairly often, year in and year out, we do not know the power of God enough. We do not know the power of God. You see some people get healed. You don't know the power of God. You just see the power of God in operation. It's not knowing the power of God. That won't do anything for you internally as far as your spirit is concerned, except quicken your faith. Your faith can be quickened without he watching healings. How many people have had faith over the centuries who never saw a healing? And I have to say, yeah, I've seen he healings in my own meeting happen. Yeah, I've seen healings happen. But most churches I've been in, I've never seen a healing happen. And most of the campaigns that I've watched the famous campaigns conduct, did we ever see a healing happen? No. Sometimes. Where did you see one happen? Maybe um, the American, David Carroll. What, what did he do? Uh, I suppose not a miracle, casting out demons. Oh, no, no. No, I mean the healing of the sick. Yeah, no. I've se we've seen many ca uh, demons cast out. That's easy to do. It's easy to cast out demons. Why, Lorraine, when she was... Twelve, went camping with a few others in Indonesia and, and one of the Chinese boys went up to a, a, an area where there was a known, were known demons and ghosts. Don't laugh at this, but it happens. He was not a believer. 
he got immediately got demons. And he ca uh, came back to the ba uh, camp and I think his sister got them too. So Ah Fung, another Chinese girl, a friend of Lorene's had accepted Christ and she I'd baptised her in our bathroom. <laughs> all I could do was push her under the water because all we had was that water, you know, that you tip over yourself. And she spoke in tongues. And Lorene. And so somebody said, or let us pray to our, our God or something like that. Gods. Chinese didn't have Jesus Christ or God. So I, I can't remember what Arfong and Lorene did, but I know what Lorene did. She cast the demon out. She was only 12. Now, she, she was a little spiritual, but not particularly spiritual. You know, a 12-year-old. Uh, but she used to come to our Bibles, our prayer meetings every night, come to think of it, when everybody was speaking in tongues. Yeah, but anyway, she cast the demon out when she was 12. It's easy to cast out demons uh, when you're walking with the Lord. And a lot of people make a fuss about it. You don't have to ask demons their names in case you've heard that going on. No, Jesus never did never ask the demons their name. He just said to the man who had the legion of demons, if you've heard this story, what he was saying, what he was saying to the, he said to the man, who are you? Because the man was so full of legions. How many dozens is that? Now, uh, we knew a girl who had 38 demons and they would all get cast out and then they'd all be back in a few days until she got baptized in the spirit, if I remember rightly. Well, she had 38. And of course, in those days, we used to, we went through the, the, the whole rigmarole. What's your name? And they'd all name themselves, and out they come. They were basically characteristics, I think. I don't know. I would never do that today. Because we didn't know what to do, to tell you the truth. See, but we got the demons out. When I say we, I played a minor part. But the demons came out. Now, Jesus wasn't asking the demons' names. He was asking the man because the man had so many demons that he, he was, in a way, unconscious of his own identity. Now, you, can you imagine if there were a hundred demons? Now, this girl who had 38, she was declared insane by the medical authorities. So she wasn't herself, was she? She was in insanity. But what would it be like if you had a hundred? So Jesus was saying, who are you? Even then, he just said, I am de legion. Mm -hmm. See, he didn't recognize his own name. He was so taken over by demons. And you would rarely find that today. Uh, uh, well, I've never heard of it and never seen it. Not that I've seen everything but, or heard of everything. But that was the reason. I just passed it on. And so then Jesus said, have you not read in the book of Moses, Exodus 4? You see, Jesus recognized the Old Testament scriptures as scriptures. And he said, where God said, I'm the God of Abraham, isn't, God is not God of the dead, but of the living. Now, this is the point I want to make to those Sadducees. What's he saying? He's saying... You know about God. And in all these three chapters he's saying, verse, chapter 11, chapter 12, and chapter 13, and everything he did, he's saying, I am. I am. The God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. And the God of Ab uh, Jacob. Now, because we followed the creed, most of us would have said, oh, yes, he's talking about God. You know, that God of the Old Testament? Well, he is. But then we make the distinction. We say, oh, here's Jesus on earth. And he's talking about that God of the Old Testament who revealed himself to Moses. And then in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, through Aaron, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. One Jehovah. Jesus is teaching in these three chapters, here I am. 
think of it. He goes up the road to Jerusalem on a, on a colt. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now Jesus knows the Old Testament scriptures. The, the, the followers of Jesus didn't really. And we'll show that later on in the next chapter. And then when he's in the temple, he's acting as God. Because he shows the authority of God. Jesus gave him all authority. All judgment is in the hands of the Son of Man, he says. I'll give you that verse later. Then he talks about, in, in chapter 12, verse 10 and verse 11, the stone that the builders rejected. He's the stone on which the building stands. Only God can have a building standing on him. But also, at the same time, only Christ can have the building on him. Christ is God, but God, Father, the Word and the Spirit, as three, are not Christ. Because it says in 1 Timothy 3.16, God, Theos, Father, the Word was now the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He didn't become the Son till he was conceived of Mary and born. There's no mention that he was ever in the Son in the Old Testament. He was the Word. The Word was made flesh. John 1.1. 1, 1. So the Word in heaven was made flesh, but in John, 1 Timothy 3.16, God, Theos, Father, the Word and the Holy Spirit was manifest made visible. So then, of course, I mentioned it about he's the God of Abraham. Now, then we, we go on further in the chapter. Then a scribe comes to him. <clears throat> there were scribes, there were Pharisees, there were priests who did secretly believe on Jesus. One of the other verses tells us that. And in chapter 12, where we're still at, he answers. The scribe says, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, Hear, O Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and with all your strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now when we think of the Lord your God, we think of John chapter 1 verse 14. The Word was made flesh. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Here now He becomes the Son, and God is the Father. And God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A mystery. You can't find a verse that distinguishes, like the creeds do. Then He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what did Jesus say? By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And what does he say about himself? If you love me, keep my commandments. Here's God. And when he quotes this to the scribe, of course, we know that he's answering the scribe and that he's talking about the law. We know he's talking about the Ten Commandments. But incorporated in that, if you look for it, you can see there is this something about these three chapters that is saying, here I am. I am God manifested in the flesh. Because remember, this is all on the way to, to the cross. Uh, and it would appear that it's uh, consecutive. Not all the chapters of the Gospels are consecutive. And I haven't checked the dates on this. But it's in the last few days before he went up to the cross. Then, and why I'm telling, saying all these things is, 
because here's the pivotal point. In Mark 12, verse 35, And as Jesus taught in the temple, here's the son of David teaching in the temple, here's the king already announced teaching in the temple, here's the judge who's already used judgment and casting the uh, money sellers out, money makers out, what does he talk about then? How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Verse 35. David himself said in the Holy Spirit, declared, or it might be by in the Greek, you know. The Greek word for in, by, of is the same word. And of course the translators just use the word they think is most appropriate and not necessarily is it most appropriate. That's just by the way. Uh, because then he says, ah, because personally I think it was David himself by the Holy Spirit declared, because David said on his deathbed, the Spirit of God spake by me. Remember? Mm -hmm. His word was in my tongue. He didn't say he was in my heart like he is to us today. Yet on the other hand, he was there. But, you know, let's stick to the, the dogma of the scriptures. Then he said, what's, what's he say? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And to read that, we have to go back to, of course, the book of Psalms. And uh, it is found in Psalm 110 where David says, The Lord, or Jehovah, says to my Lord, or Master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now that's interesting that that's what the translation there says because I looked it up. Well, that's what uh, one says, and I'm not, the, uh, not, a, not a Hebrew or Greek scholar. But in any, 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 in any case, it relates to the fact of his deity. Because he says in verse 37, David himself calls him Lord. And uh, uh, that would be curious. See, they're both curious. He would have said in verse 36, so I don't know why that person said, that dictionary person said that, Strong's it was, Strong's Dictionary. I, I didn't think to look up any other. But now I'm, I'm saying this. In verse 36 of chapter, Mark chapter 12, the Lord, curious, said to my Lord, curious, and the same things in verse 37. So he's talking about God the deity. And so he's saying, here I am, God. Then we go down to verse 41. What happens here? He is sitting outside the treasury. And the people were putting money into the offering box. There's always offering. There's always money that comes into the house of God and into the preachers of God. They're supposed to get money. They were just in the offerings box. This wasn't the tithes. That's why the Pentecostals say the tithes and offerings. Well, it's not tithes today. But there is offering. There is giving. God is a giver. We are givers. We give of our time. We give of ourselves. We give of our money. We give of everything we can. We've been, I've, been, I've been going to the mission field for years, not looking at what I spend, just giving and giving and giving, getting into debt to do it, but giving and giving and giving. We're supposed to give. We're givers. And this is a wonderful story 
because here is Jesus the judge who reads hearts. John 5 verse 22. God has committed all judgment unto the Son. Committed, has committed, past tense. He already was exercising his power of judgment in his deity on certain occasions while he was here on earth. He did not do everything in his deity. Mostly he did not. His acts of power. But nevertheless, he spoke in his deity. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. So when Jesus is speaking to the people, it says deity. It says God. You can believe every word. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Why? It's eternal, coming from the lips of the eternal one who was standing there before them. And so he looks at this poor widow and she put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he, you know, when I was in Indonesia and even in India, in Indonesia, I think they did it out of love. They would sneak a little bit of money into my hand sometime. You know, to them, it was a lot. To me, it was nothing. Probably a penny. I took it. A lot of missionaries didn't. They would say, oh, think, say, oh we're rich enough. I don't, no, I, I, that's not right. That person was doing it to God and doing it with a love. Now, in India, they do it sometimes, and sometimes I think it might be because they had this offer, this habit in Hinduism of giving to the priest, and they carry it on to, into the church, and there are times when they hand money into your hand. Well, I don't refuse it. That would be rude. So I don't know what the real reason is in those cases. But this poor woman came and she gave everything, he said. This poor ward widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering boss. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now that was faith. That was love. She put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The judge saw it and he commended her. She was laying up treasures in heaven, didn't know it. Her treasures were in heaven. Hmm, makes you wonder, doesn't it? How much of a treasure she's going to get of those overcome by terror or astonishment or of falling dead suddenly. To be thrust down. To fall under judgment. To ca who came under condemnation. So Jesus is talking about in Matthew 21 verse 44. The judgment that was going to come upon the children of Israel. And what does your translation say in verse 44, please, Peter? And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Yeah. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, you see, that's what Peter, that's why Peter understood it was about the dispersion. It's not in the, any other version. What version is that? NASB. Yeah, I've, that's the only Bible I have that's NASB. I normally don't use it. But that gives you the picture. It was talking about the dispersion of the Jews. He must have understood it when he translated, whoever under tra translated that. But you can see it's talking about judgment anyway. It will crush him. What happened to the children of Israel? They were crushed or they were killed or they were dispersed. Now Jesus is talking about this. Well, I can understand why people miss the meaning if they didn't look up the Greek meaning, which most do not, and if they didn't have an NASB. But if they had an NASB, how could they miss that Jesus is talking about the nation of Israel in that particular area of the verse? And so getting back to Mark, where I, I have most of my notes, We have to say that 
Jesus in these last days when he was going up to the cross revealed himself as God, acted as judge, acted as judge in speaking as the Son of Man, who when he was risen would be on the right hand of God as judge. He's already acting as the Son of Man, who is really the judge and who has had all judgment given into his hands. When he talks about Matthew 24, when he talks about Mark chapter 13, he's talking about the destruction of the temple, the end of the Jews, the tribulation that came upon them, the great tribulation. And he says, this is the coming of the Son of Man. And he said, then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. Now the elect are not in the four winds because the winds are blowing in the atmosphere unless they're in aeroplanes. So it's not literal. Correct? Can you follow me there? He says, from the four winds. Everybody misses that and I did too. And of course we just look at from the ends of the earth. Well, the ends of the earth to us is all around the globe. In those days, they didn't even know it was a globe. To the ends of heaven. They had no aeroplanes in those days, so they couldn't have had people up there in aeroplanes flying at this time. So it's not literal, is it? And we everybody's thought it was literal. Did you? Because I did. Everybody did. That's what we're taught. This is Mark 13, 27. Yeah, it's not literal. So he's not talking about the coming of the Lord, uh, the coming of the Lord. He's talking about the coming of the Son of Man. The coming of the Son of Man is not the coming of the Lord. When Jesus Christ descends from heaven, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, 52, and, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself, not the Son of Man, the Lord of glory, the Lord himself will descend. Here is the Son of Man. He's not talking about the second coming, which everybody says it is. Although those who believe in pre-trib, I don't know how they fit that in, but anyway, this is what everybody has said. He's talking about, <coughs> he's just talking about it's such a terrible tribulation. These things will happen. And during that tribulation, they will see that it's the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. He's causing the judgment. Now, whether they saw it then, which mostly they did not, the believers would have, the disciples would have. They would have remembered this. But they will see it one day. They will see that what happened, if, if they didn't see it when they crossed over the other side, which is possible, once they were taken into the, cha with chains of darkness, once they were taken into the dark place at their death from Jerusalem, maybe immediately they knew the Son of Man's done this. Who knows? You know, you remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man? All the things that were going down on in the underworld? There's things going on. So, Let's look at it from that point of view. And, and we see it has nothing to do with the coming of the Lord, nothing to do with the end of the church age. It's to do with the end of the Jewish age. And so here is, he is as the Son of Man. So in those chapters, on his ascent to the cross, he, he is the Son of God, the Son of Man. He is God in the flesh. He is the judge. He is, has a position of power and authority. And also, 
he has told them in John, it, it, and this is the same time, now is the Son of Man glorified. Now. He's just been to Gethsemane. He's taken to Pilate's judgment hall. Now is the Son of Man glorified. Who saw him glorified then? Nobody. Only the angels. Nobody saw it. It was the glory thing. Now did they? The disciples saw that it was a time of sorrow that hit them. They doubted everything. They did. They were full of doubt. Not one of them believed. Not one of them believed he would rise from the dead. Not one. So, this is the Christ who has manifest, is manifested as God on his way to the cross. What a lonely walk. Hmm? What a lonely walk. Yeah. No one believed. Yeah. Yeah, no one, no one could see. Hmm. And not even John. I mean, Jesus said to him, Behold your mother and behold your son. You know... Yeah, amazing. Yeah, well, the Bible is an amazing book. That's all I can say. But you see, you, you need to... People need, we need to be full of the Holy Ghost as much as we can and to progress in the Holy Ghost. And it takes years to progress in the Holy Ghost. But, you know, some people get there so fast, so don't think it will always take years. You might get there. You get, quick, you get quickly. can get quickly. And, uh, but then you see, it comes as the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. And we do err if we no, do not have, know the scriptures also, as well as knowing them as the gospel, as also as well as knowing them in relation to the fact that the Holy Spirit is our teacher and everybody has the Holy Spirit. We do err when we are not deep enough in the Holy Ghost to have the words of wisdom and the words of knowledge to get those extras that come that are not new revelations but are words of wisdom and knowledge about the revelation that has been given through the Word of God, through the prophets and the apostles. Only the apostles and the prophets got the revelation. We don't get the revelation. We receive the revelation they received then we get words of wisdom and words of knowledge about the revelation as Paul said in Ephesians 1 that you might have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So the, the revelation we have is the knowledge of Christ and that comes mainly through the word of God, through the word of Christ but it also comes through the operation of the spirit as we pray in other tongues because Many times the scriptures are unveiled as you're praying in tongues or afterwards as never before. And many times you don't see Jesus in the flesh. You don't see him in your mind. You don't picture him. But there's such a new recognition of Jesus, somehow or other. And of course everybody gets new recognitions of Jesus up to a point. Some get it by singing a hymn. But it's a little recognition. There's something deeper when you get it in the Holy Ghost. That's all I can say. And that's what we all need. Amen. Amen.